Welcome to Outbreak. Um, this is a new series um, hosted by the Getty, where we uh, take a brief moment to talk about often objects in our collection, but um, other topics, anything art related. And uh, today, um, it is my pleasure to welcome you from the Getty Villa. And my name is Jens Dehner. I'm a curator in antiquities here at the Getty Villa. And uh, my guest uh, is Ken Gonzalez Day. And he's a Los Angeles based artist and a professor of art at Scripps College. Um, first, I wanted to acknowledge that we are broadcasting this program from the Getty Villa in Los Angeles on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, honoring and respecting the deep history of this region. Also, I wanted all of you to know that uh, this program is being recorded and will be made available um, in full on YouTube in um, about two weeks time or sooner. So Ken's practice as an artist um, is centered very much uh, around photography. And uh, in this, uh, Ken, you have a special interest in, in portraits. And one of your large scale uh, works um, shown here on the right, um, an image of Gordon in, from a series called Memento Mori, um, is currently actually on view in an exhibition called Photoflux Unshuttering LA at uh, Getty Center. Um, but um, when I first encountered your work, um, that is about, I would say, 10 years ago, when you were a, a fellow at the Getty Research Institute with us for an entire year. And uh, at that point, you embarked um, on a project photographing a lot of the, or in fact, all uh, of the <laughs> busts uh, in our collection, sculpted busts in our collections, be it in European sculpture, but also, and that was my particular interest, in, um, in the antiquities collection at the Getty Villa. And um, for me, this was in interesting ways revealing. I'm often, I, I'm kind of my area of expertise is in Roman sculpture and then also in Roman portraiture. And for me, your photographs uh, of these busts, somehow um, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but they were sort of eye-opening. It was like they, they were photographed in a very different way than what I was used to as an art historian and uh, like sort of like analyzing and sort of discussing it or writing about it, publishing, um, and uh, the way I was used to, to, to look uh, at, at ancient portraits. So can you tell us a bit about this project you embarked back then? Uh, what was it uh, that drew you to sculpted busts? Great. Well, first off, thank you for inviting me. And it's nice to see you virtually, uh, if not in person. Um, that indeed was a long time ago when I was at the, the, at the GRI, the Getty Research Institute. And basically my project there was to um, think about the collection, think about the museum, and think about its location, you know, being in Los Angeles. And uh, as a uh, Angelino native, or someone that lives here, been here for a long time, over 20 some years, I was just interested in thinking about the relationship between the individuals who live in this town and the museum itself. And, and, and so to start out, I, I wanted to sort of visit the, the individuals there. So the portraits was the sort of beginning way of thinking, well, who's in this museum? Who's represented? Who isn't? And how do I fit in? And who are these people? So I want to go in a way, meet them and engage with them and, and figure out um, what I could learn from them, what they could tell me. And so that's sort of how it started. The, the pairing you see here, of course, um, also sort of highlights the idea of the, the photographic uh, component, meaning that I photograph them in different ways than, than a traditional um, museum photographer whose job might be to photograph an object in a way that is very specific for the museum's use. And that's very different from what I do. Um, 
up and around the question of what's visible or not visible, shadow, light. And you can see in the portrait that the, with that t-shirt, it's almost like a bust you know, image as well. And the idea of the, the light helping to describe an individual to give us some insight into that uh, particular moment in time and to capture that photographically. So that's sort of how it started. And, um, and maybe that's a good place to, to transition back to your next uh, question or repositioning of the, the work. So you mentioned um, the individual. Uh, and I thought like for me, maybe that was part of what I kind of, you know, as, a, as an art historian, archeologist, um, looking at images, or we often talk about objects, right? So you talk about an object uh, in the museum, but the moment, of course, you recognize that this object is a portrait, then it's like, yeah, but there's also a person, or there could be a person, or, you know, how, where do we, you know, where, what do we do with this? You know, <laughs> it's like, or how comfortable are we in the museum? It's sort of like, you know, this, the, we accept that portrait is, a, is an artistic genre. Um, but I think your different view and thinking of like the place, the time, sort of like individuals um, that we encounter uh, sort of helped me, you know, rethink of what we, what we do um, with portraits. But at this point, again, I wanted to see um, and ask you what happened with this project, what became of this project, what happened afterwards? Or maybe you can also before, tell us a little bit like about the entire scope of it. Sure. Uh, so, so if the beginning was to think about the museum, its collection, myself, and this idea of what are we all sort of doing here on this, on this spinning thing called an earth, <laughs> how are we gonna engage with each other? How do we see each other? Then um, if the beginning was to sort of photograph the objects in the collection, then the artwork begins after that. And so in this case, you see an example where I've taken two sculptures from the Getty, uh, the Getty Center, the main museum collection and, and brought them together photographically. So uh, by bringing them together, I've created a new context. So one that is really uh, invites the viewer to engage in real time, in real space. So in this case, it was put on a billboard. Uh, some 6 million people drove by and saw it according to the, you know, the advertisers that manage these things. Did they all experience it as an artwork? Did they all, you know, think of it the same way they would in the museum? I, I think the question was, what? How, do, how does one bring the art back to life? How does one invite people to look at these objects, not just as chunks of rock that have been abandoned uh, and or sold, bought and traded and arrived here in LA uh, by nook or by crook, but that these are uh, visitors from, from another time and another place and that they have something that we might be able to learn from them. And so that was sort of my departure point. And so uh, I've continued to photograph um, images, uh, primarily images of individuals of, of different racial and cultural backgrounds in different museum collections. And I've been to about 20, uh, 20 or so museums. And of course, thinking also about race and racial formation is one of the things that, that was part of it. Um, and the other just thing, quick thing to say is photographically that you know, I, I just take the pictures of the sculptors so that the, the, the content, if there is any content, is really um, like in this example, the empty space in between, this, the space of the figure, all of those are, are equal value and allow us to think about them as, as uh, elements, as we might think of in a sentence. Man, you know, in dark marble against, uh, in a large white space with another man, you know, facing him, are they friends? Are they lovers? Are they, you know, uh, in conflict? Are they, what are, you know, so I think that was part of it, was trying to invite uh, uh, viewers to a way to engage with works that, that seem very distant uh, for most of us. For me, it looks like a little bit like, um, maybe it's, it's trivial to say that, of course, you know, you, you create a relationship between these two objects, obviously, like they, they look at each other, right? Um, which is something that doesn't happen in the museum installation. It could, if you want it, with the, with the actual busts, you know. But, um, but what it does, um, in some way, gives um, an agency uh, to, to either of those, of those two heads that they, as sort of like 
just objects of display in somehow sort of isolated way don't have. So they become sort of like kind of each of them becomes viewers, becomes a viewer um, himself, looking at someone else. So in, in, in a way, that almost like you you take down some boundary be, be, between, let's say, I say us, sort of the viewers, and sort of the 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 portraits or the people or you know the images we are, we're looking at. Um, but I wanted to come back to sort of ancient uh, portraits because we're like, yeah, that's what we want to talk about today. And that's more of my field. Um, the, from this series, we didn't mention actually, like was the, the series called Profiled. Um, you created a, uh, a, a book um, that includes many of the uh, images and of the busts that you, that you, that you photographed. Um, and um, this one is kind of like, besides from sort of the title page, and um, this is sort of the first image in it, and it's in our galleries at the at the villa, and uh, and it's interesting for, for for many reasons, you know. I'm sort of like thinking about what is what is the first thing that that people notice as as museum visitors um, about it, but what can you recall sort of like what your when you approached it or when you then then, then work with your photographs and uh, you set it up for for your for your own lens um what it was that that interested you about it sure so uh you know in a nutshell the the, the fall semester because i was there for a full year and like an academic year the fall i was at the, the main getty center photographing the, the collection there which i was more familiar with that's you know uh the ones we just saw and then in the spring i was at the villa and basically i would photograph on the days that the museum was closed and would wander about, you know, which was pretty amazing actually, with the camera and uh, and security guard hot on my uh, on my tail <laughs> to, to make sure I didn't, you know, damage anything or whatever. And um, and so part of it was trying to think, well, what am I looking at here? You know, I get that this is a uh, <clears throat> Roman sculptures, cast copies, whatever. What, but what is it? Is it a portrait, or is it a sort of symbolic portrait? Is it an emperor? as in sort of a universal, or is it an individual? And so that began the, 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 the ones at the Getty, the, and certainly the ones we just saw, we really could tell they're individuals. There's no doubt about that. And so the question at the villa was walking through and seeing them, are these individuals, what were they like? What can we tell from this object that's here? Was this a copy of a copy? Was this an original, uh, was it painted? You know, um, what does the label tell us about it? So there were a lot of things that I needed to, to, to learn about how the, the museum sees the objects, which is different from the way that I might see the objects, or even the average viewer might see the objects. You walk into a room with a bunch of marble heads. How do you engage with that? And I, and I watch people, I spend a lot of time watching people look at the collection as well and seeing which ones they look at, seeing what they look for. And so for me, part of it was trying to find the trying to find the individual in inside of the, the bust. So trying to adjust the lighting so that it seemed as if this could be a person. Um, and there are certain angles in which you see a, a, a sculpture where it just looks like a rock, or it looks like, you know, there might be different elements of it that are more visible to you. And so part of it was trying to add this humanity back to these objects that come to us from, you know, from across time and across the planet and have arrived here and uh, and we get a few minutes the average person what spends 30 seconds in front of it or less so trying to think about how uh talk about speed dating right this is a very quick exchange um <laughs> that is very one-sided so i guess for me i was trying to think of a photograph as a way of slowing down myself and inviting others to see what i see and to think about the figure in a different way and so um in this particular one I think it's a very tender image. Um, we know it would have been, I think we know, it would have been painted and it would have had eyeballs that would have had, you know, irises and pupils and would look very different from what we're seeing here. Uh, we can also see that it, it's missing the rest of the body. So again, the title as you can see there is head of a man as opposed to bust of a man, meaning that there may have been a body <laughs> connected to it. And so this idea of the fragmented piece that we have, um, you can see the repair work that's been done on the ear. And so each of these things be becomes something of a story to 
uh, help us understand something of the past. Um, speaking of speed dating, let's look at this. Okay. Um, so, and then I wanted to ask you, of course, about obviously the question here is about color. Um, and the head we just looked at actually does um, appear uh, uh, if you if you look for it in a different from a different angle. So 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 um, what was this? So where does sort of color come in um, in your exploration or like in maybe sort of like a long term sort of outcome of that of that profile project? <clears throat> right. So if, if the beginning of the project was thinking about just what collections are here and, and have a look at them. By this point that I've made this work, I've been to many different museums across, uh, you know, in a number of different countries. These are mostly Europe and the US. Um, and photographed objects that had once been displayed or were currently on display. And so I was thinking about the depiction of race and the idea of racial formation as we understand it and how it was understood in, in museum displays, basically. So you see there's uh, uh, depictions of all different races and many different cultures for many different periods. And so I was trying to think about this idea of whiteness as a construct that begins really through the uh, sort of the study of ancient objects, white marble uh, objects, and the sort of uh, imagining of a classic world um, in, that's happening in the 18th and 19th century. And then the, the formation of basically racial displays or cultural displays in the 19th and 20th century. And so there's a, a number of objects here that were uh, in various museum collections to educate the public, to represent different ideas about human difference. And I arranged them here, you know, basically by based on their physical color, as opposed to their sort of cultural or sort of uh, racial color. So 41 objects arranged by color goes from dark to white, tries to highlight the arbitrary nature of racial categorizations and of color uh, in particular. And, you know, there's, and the objects themselves, some of them were, were rather remarkable. Um, and each one has a story and the full title has all of the original titles and uh, information from each object, but that was too much to put on a slide here, but I will uh, make sure that it is updated on my website if anybody wants to go see what all of the individual objects are. Maybe we can uh, uh, focus on one of the, uh, the heads there, which you, um, all of you may have uh, sort of spotted or recognized uh, again from the from the title uh, slide, and that's um, this this uh, from the right from the white end of your spectrum. <laughs> that's this um, that's this boy, and uh, or a, a child, an image of a child of, of the Roman period, um, and it was um, from all we know about it is is based really on an analysis of the um, of the particular of a particular style. Uh, of, of of sculpture and portraiture, and so we know that this uh, image uh, was made in the uh, not the image that you photographed, but the, of the sculpt the sculpture and uh, Roman sculpture was made in the about in the middle of the second century A.D. Um, <coughs> and unfortunately, we do not know much as excuse me uh, about like where where it comes from exactly, where it was found, where it would have been displayed, where what the name of this, uh, of this child as much as we would like to know. And, um, but it's an interesting topic because we talked about color before. Um, I, I sometimes I, give, I gave a tour, you know, to visitors at the Getty Villa that is about color, but mostly it's actually about its absence. Uh, and, uh, and I try to, to remind people that what you when you look at sculptures and it particularly marble sculptures um, and with bronzes to some degree um, you'll never see the way or I, I mean I, I mean there may be some ex extraordinary examples sort of you know where this is preserved but you never see the way uh, an ancient viewer contemporary to to this time like in the second century AD would have seen this image and um, and we uh, and we also can only approximate you know where we you know what what this would have looked like um, but at this point um, so we come back to the question maybe um, 
can you, you mentioned that these were painted and all of this of course we in this case we have actually found any trace of it um but based on our uh on our exchange and our conversation i keep thinking of like we should maybe have another look we have you know advanced technologies and so on what what color what, what role paint sort of physical color would, would 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 play in the representation um of this image of this of, of this particular child and uh and uh so i can wanted to come back to the question that you raised earlier sort of like who are we looking at not so much what are we looking at who are we looking at and um what uh, you know in your photograph of it so that interests me again um is and and you know for this particular image is what would you like people to see in your photograph that you think maybe they can't see when they stand in front of the object inside our museum right well one thing we can see is we can see it in a through a perspective in other words through uh, through my eyes through the, the camera's eyes and that decision itself is something to look at and to consider right so already by itself you that, that will slow hopefully for those that are interested in photography it will slow the individual down and say why why am i looking at this why is the the photographer chosen this to to isolate this in this way obviously the lighting i tried to capture it so we could see the eyes of and get the expression the ex and the the texture of the uh, of the finish what we see right away is that there seems to be uh, an exaggeration right of the scale of the eyes or of the feature of the eyes or um maybe the texture of the hair is very stylized in keeping with the period and so um I, I, maybe we'll get to this afterwards but even the question of the title has uh, changed since I was since I photographed it originally, and so I think the label very cautiously or currently doesn't even tell us the gender, right? So I tend to read it as like a little boy, but I, I think that that's there's no way to be sure of that. And uh, again, because it may not have been in this full form, you know, when it was presented, it might have looked a little different. So uh, even things like uh, that we would take for granted as being able to assume we can't. So that's the, the first part. And then the second part was sort of thinking about, um, I, I actually posted on my Instagram just to see what people thought. And, and really, it was really an interesting conversation, basically because of the pandemic, not able to have these in-person conversations, right? Like, like we are here today, we're not in person. It'd be great to, to be able to talk about this, like, you know, in front of the object or something. But the question of, is this, is this child black, right? And what do we mean by that? Uh, that's really was the, the thing I've been trying to wrestle with and was thinking about at the time. And then if this child is, uh, you know, rep or not, it right? could be just Middle Eastern, North African, it could be a lot of, it could just be stylized, it could be, you know, all kinds of things. So that was sort of the, the initial um, interest in the object and, and in the way it was displayed. And the thing that most people were reading when they were walking around looking at it, right? They were reading as a, as a racialized object. And so that is part of the physical experience that people have of it in person. And now the question is, well, how do we know that's true? How much of that is true? Is it a portrait or is it just a, a generic type? These are the questions that we don't know, right? And then also, again, because it's, it doesn't have uh, the body attached, was it part of a full figure or was it, you know, really a, a portrait bust at all? And then the, the last element would be, given the time period that this is done, would this would this individual have been a slave right it seems that in all likelihood right that's if there was sort of right well you you tell me <laughs> well um well i have many thoughts about exactly yeah. those all of the questions you raised you actually i thought i was going to ask the questions anyway so um <laughs> no uh, i wanted to sort of show this like side by side actually uh with, with another object um, another portrait I really should be more careful with that when I say object while we're talking about people. <laughs> and so, uh, and uh, uh, there's another object, uh, another portrait in the gallery, in the same gallery, in fact, um, of, a, uh, of a little boy. And, uh, and interestingly here is like, you see sort of immediate differences on you know, different levels, of course, hairstyle, you know, the ways the eyes look, they're not carved. Uh, you, you have the complete image uh in this case a bust 
that is carved is sort of like from one piece of marble with this with this square of base on it and on the base is an inscription i mean it's like the, one, one of those rare cases where we have um you know an, a lot uh, or most of it minus the color and minus the context in which exactly um this was displayed uh, from the inscription we can assume that was was a what we call a funerary portrait that was carved at the occasion of this small boy's um, death and um and so so we already know more about it um historically let's say you know and at the same time when we're looking at the faces we're looking again sort of looking at the person inside you know the bust um or we're looking at the way the face looks we uh, there seem to be in my view is a lot more sort of like of an individual to be seen in the uh, in the boy on the left um and that is but then in, in and of itself is also a factor of style and and period it's a function of that time where like this is only around this time sort of like in the second century where sculptors started to carve the eyes as opposed to just paint in sort of a gaze the, the, the boy with the blank you know sort of eyes they, they, he would not have had blank eyes they would have been painted in you know they would have been painted in his hair they would have been painted in the inscription they would have been painted on his tunic etc and um but what is what i wanted to to say here is also interesting because you touched on it in terms of period we see these different hairstyles right and if you see that we read the hair, we are likely to read the hairstyle of the of the boy on the left as something that sort of goes with some whatever ethnic profile, what, what you want to call it, or pre you know, sort of like a conception of it. Um, whereas um, what we know is that both of these boys' hairstyles are actually a, a kind of like a period thing, so they're like a, sort of like in that period, um, sculpted portraits. Um, um, of people tend to choose hairstyles that are modeled by the rulers, in this case, Roman emperors. So the boy on the right, uh, his name is, is Marshall, by the way, and he has a hairstyle that is sort of like the signature hairstyle of the emperor Trajan at the very beginning of the second uh, century AD. And uh, the boy on the left has a hairstyle that is very common among the, uh, what we call the Antonine dynasty, uh, of emperors that lasted through a sort of like most of the second half um, of the um, and longer for like, like two generations uh, of the second century AD. So so that's even not individual in this way, you know. In a way, you 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 could have subtract that sort of as a as a as a as a feature. You know, try to imagine the boy on the left with the hairstyle of the boy on the right, so swap hair, and then think, you know, what happens then. So we have to do this not like with our own stereotypes, but we also know sort of where certain types and sort of like, um, uh, you know, there's sort of like a, the casting of a type happens in the conception of an image in the second century AD. And that's something very common. So there's even, this, so can we, sometimes it even affects the looks, the very faces sort of, of, of more of older um, uh, uh, persons in portraits, they start to even, their physiognomy start to look like those of the rulers. People call it the period face. It's it, it's weird, but it but it's true. <laughs> weird but true. Uh, my kids love that. So so um, so this is what um, what's happening there. But I think um, we have gone um, to uh, uh, for a long time, and I want to make sure that um, we also have uh, questions answered from the audience uh, if there are questions so i'm gonna um see if we can if we can open it up for questions <clears throat> so the first question here that i see um is uh, can you meaning can speak to the designation of the memento mori title to the first in the first pairing sure that that group of portraits was done as a part of a larger project where i basically was looking at the history of lynching in California and basically documenting that history for the first time and ultimately identified over 350 cases in the state of California and basically uh, went out to look for sites and photograph some of the 
possible sites. And, and I also invited a number of um, young models, basically the same age, same race as the victims to pose for me. So they were rather than, um, I guess, photographing or representing dead individuals, I wanted living individuals to represent those that had been taken. And so, uh, they're, so they're portraits, but they're portraits responding to California history. And so, uh, and it's quite a large print as well. So uh, really thinking about memorials and, uh, and how the portrait stands in for a general, you know, a generic idea as these portraits do. The, the reverse is same true. If we look at this question of what is a portrait, at what point does the individual become, you know, distinct from the, I guess the type as you're saying of the two. So when we look at these two images, we see what look like uh, from our contemporary perspective as racially coded images, right? That's what I think most of us see. And yet uh, that is part of a construct that has taken thousands of years to evolve, right? In a sense, or to develop, maybe evolve is the wrong word, um, in terms of how we read the shorthand of the image and how the image is resonates for us culturally. Where do we see ourselves? Where do we see whiteness in either of these? Do we see, right? Do we see difference of any kind? And so those are questions that I think are really interesting around the idea of what is a portrait? What constitutes a portrait? How do we know something um, uh, is a portrait and not just a representative of a type or, uh, or as you say, a sort of, uh, you know, a universal. So another question um, for Ken. Um, you mentioned wondering how you would fit in when you looked at the Getty's collection of busts. Did you decide you do fit in? <laughs> That's a great question. So there are no there are no Latinx busts, right? And that part of the other sort of underlying interest is why is it that Latinx bodies uh, are so hard to represent and so hard to find represented? Now, of course, they wouldn't have been in the ancient world, um, but that sort of was the underlying thing. Thinking about the Americas, thinking about basically just thinking about the different ways that that people that have lived on the land here, uh, the land that the Getty's on and the land that I'm on, right? And thinking about what stories do we tell from here? What stories can we tell as individuals, you as a scholar, me as an artist, how can we contribute to uh, the understanding of, of the human experience? What, what do we have to add to it? And I think uh, for me, certainly the portrait was a wonderful way to try to, to bring back that there is something we can connect to in these objects as distant and as strange as they might be, objects also that might be rendered in a way that, that is problematic still provide us an uh, access point to think about um, culture and cultural formation, difference, universality, all of those things. So I think that's, that's uh, the takeaway for me. And, and so in a sense, I suppose I did find the individuality of, of, in some of those busts and, um, and you know, enjoyed hanging out with some of them, right? Spending some time, <laughs> enjoyed the view. So uh, enjoyed the, the opportunity to think around um, what gets remembered and what gets forgotten. I wanted to mention that we are, it's kind of like at the point where officially sort of like the, we are at the end of the program, but we have plenty more questions. Um, feel free to, to stay with us a little longer and we try to answer some more. Um, so uh, here's another question about uh, for Ken that says, um, when looking at ancient portraiture, we think we're looking at people, but ancient artists clearly made choices to emphasize particular features, often idealizing them. How much does uh, Ken's practice purport to present reality rather than create one? It's a great question. What is a portrait? Does it exist? So is an image of Jesus? If you think of the European collections, is that is that a portrait, or is that a type? Think of the Virgin Mary. All think of all of the religious imagery. We know who you know Saint, Saint Francis is. We know whatever. There might be certain cultural things that are that that read as being more universal. Are those portraits or are those uh, right sort of iconic things? And I think that's that's the the age old debate 
that is still of interest. But I think even with a portrait, any of those decisions are also going to represent, as you said, the sort of period in which they're made and the kind of questions that are being asked. So even by re sort of reinterrogating what we think of as a portrait, I think we can try to nuance our understanding of how we think about human difference, uh, think about authorship, think about intentionality, and perhaps think about the role of the museum. That um, is actually a good keyword because there's a question about curators here that says, can you as a curator say more about how you're rethinking labels and what you can or should say on them when there's so little room to say anything? Uh, and then the label can have a lot of power by its brevity, I believe. So um, that I may, we were going to talk about it a little bit, you know, in the in uh, in in our conversation about titles and about how they change and you can sort of like you always like complain if you change titles too much because you try to catch up with them for the titles of your work um and so we recently you know the the the, the image of the, the the young boy that's on the screen we actually recently looked at it as part of a of um um process where we, we thought we wanted to see, we wanted to look at images that we we think um, are presenting, you know, black, representing black Africans. And uh, in a previous uh, iteration, some time ago, we called, we actually did have a title for this, for this portrait, and we call it the, the portrait of, a, of an African child or, or something like this. And so, um, in this process um and earlier already like what i was thinking about how like it's like how you know what is it that makes us call this boy african where was like with this other boy i we showed earlier and we don't you know give any um, sort of adjective in the label that would point to his you know whatever the racial setup uh, and uh, but why are we compelled to, to, to sort of point this out? Um, and then I looked sort of like a little closer and then what I mentioned earlier about the hair, so sort of I started to look sort of like sort of other features about, about this boy. And there's a lot in there that you can see that is A, um, really just sort of like a style of, the, of, the, of that period, you know, like sort of big eyes, the way they're carved. And there are features that are, um, uh, very common among sort of like toddlers or sort of really young age. But this this, this uh, boy is probably you know less than two years old, um, and uh, and so that are sort of kind of you could you could conceive as stereotypical for a child, you know, but for maybe for any child or with a child of 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 of, of another race as well. Uh, so so we I am um, um, actually still open to the question of what who this child you know if, if sort of like who this child represent if it's something if this is if this is an, in, in in fact someone uh who we could label as black african and um but as we did so as we did sort of discuss this um uh, i was um uh, you know i was always like torn between whether like sort of like okay sort of like maybe we, we sort of write something sort of more informed and we put in a longer uh, description addressing these questions in our online sort of collection, um, uh, you know, online collections that you can go on the on the website and look at, and not on the on the physical label. Um, but I think like if we don't, what well, what if we don't put this in the title? Um, are we, you know, potentially depriving this individual depicted here of part of his or her identity? Uh, and <laughs> but so so that was a bit of a I feel like this is um this is a really relevant question um that we are that we're looking at and and uh but I don't think there's a I have not arrived at a sort of like a, a, a any formula or or you know way of 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 answering this um in a in a final way so so, so that's why that's why I like this. I think the process is really important, and that we are more conscious about how we use language, how we use sort of how we address 
someone, particularly when it when it's about sort of individuals we know nothing else about. Why point out sort of like that something that we think is the case, and it's kind of like you know you can set it up in the museum this way that let's say this boy looks a lot different than other images you have, and sort of these are all um, factors that as as curators we do control to a good degree, but we uh, sort of you know we do things that are sort of like handed down to us and we are not um so that's why we we started rethinking this 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 type of labeling um let's see what time we, we still have time for a couple more questions i think um let me see what we have here. oh um how does your Getty project, Ken, fit into the evolution or trajectory of your photography practice? Good question. So the um, the Getty project was really with the beginning where the profiled series began. So really thinking about the history of racial formation and museum display, and specifically looking at the way these objects have been named and and renamed and so the Getty of course is really interesting for that as we already mentioned that the titles change so often but the other part that's uh important for um for the future is basically to think about what what a museum can do right so there's what it what it should do what it can do what it might do what it has done and so the whole all of the conventions around um around naming or not around labeling all that stuff are potentially um, open to, to, uh, to change, including how we think about disciplines, how we think about the different categories. So the project uh, continues in the sense that I'm still trying to come to terms with to understand the legacies of racial formation as they exist in our museums today and, and ultimately to create uh, responses to that history that will allow people to change that history. So even the conversation we're having today, right? When I photographed that object, it did have the word, you know, African in the title. And that, and now ten years later, uh, it's seen in, in another way. And I think we want to make sure that that sensitivity doesn't lead to erasure and absence. And that part of the strategy of thinking, of all of us thinking, to, working together to think about how we want to represent. Uh, the human experience and how we want to shape that and so the the label is important the curator is important the artist is important all of these the audience is important and we need to also meet people where they are if there are questions things that are people are seeing in the object we need to be able to address it i did do a quick just i think i mentioned to you earlier i loaded the image into google images to see what the algorithms would think of it and that was pretty fascinating and that's a whole other conversation but there are a lot of these ongoing questions about how how basically how, how race is mediated uh, understanding race is mediated by all kinds of factors and we have to find ways to um deconstruct to make clear to make visible um the dynamics that have shaped the way that these objects have been seen in the past so that we can shape how they are seen in the future and so i think that's could be seen as both a, a great potential for the field uh, of art, of art history, of scholarship, also for the field of post-colonial studies, of sort of thinking around race and racial formation and and coming to uh, more complicated understandings of culture than we have, than we grew up with. Uh, I think, Ken, we have uh, plenty more questions, but um, our program comes to an end. And uh, I wanted to uh, thank everyone for being here for also for for shaping our conversation with your questions even if you didn't get to your particular question um and uh thank in uh very much ken gonzalez day for being here and uh, for being a friend of the gettys you see like that you uh there are there are links and uh, that you that that were posted for you about like where you can find out more about ken's work and um uh, also, we wanted to make sure that you um, uh, stay sort of in touch with the Gettys programs. There's more of these art breaks coming up.
check out Getty EDU under the sort of what's on uh, feature. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you, Ken. And uh, have a good day. Thank you for having me.